This episode, Tom Rodriguez, affectionately called T-Rod, he's back for his third appearance on the No BS Marketing Show. We start off talking about how March Madness impacts productivity and how companies need to embrace it. Then we spend some time talking about the marketing around March Madness and how even local and regional companies can leverage March Madness in their promotional messaging and their social media. Then we spend some time talking about leadership and communication from a coaching standpoint and how coaches have to communicate beyond just strategy and talking to players. Hope you enjoy it. And again, T-Rod makes his third appearance on the No BS Marketing Show. Bullshit. It's the March Madness episode of the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Tom Rodriguez, a entrepreneur, business development guru, owner of his own business, basketball coach, basketball aficionado, and guru. So Tom is also a repeat guest to the No BS Marketing Show. Tom, welcome. Welcome back. Thanks. Third time now. Is it the third time? The third time now. Wait, wait. When was the second time? We've we've done this three times, three straight years. What was the first one? I didn't realize you made it. Yeah, three this times. is three times. See, so he's the only third. I think he's full of it. I don't no, I, gonna... you you can hit the VS button, but I know it's been three times now. You've been on the show three times out of a hundred fifty. What episode is this? One. You'll be your episode one fifty two. Right. The the first episode was kind of an introduction to me. The second episode was March Madness last year, and now three. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Third time on the show. What, are you, what what kind of feedback do you get from your appearances here? <laughs> well, you know, um, you know, unfortunately, the the people that uh, that follow me uh, are not as business savvy as we are. So, you know, when I tell my mother or my sisters or blah blah blah, I mean, they think it's going to show up on the news. You know, at, at uh, five o'clock. So. With Lester Holt, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But uh, no, I'm, I'm excited to be back. You know, I I, I love March Madness, and uh, I love talking about marketing. And you know, I, I I have to do this to legitimize my my profile on LinkedIn, which you know now has ties to Mass Solutions. So I don't want anyone to hit a hit a BS button on me for saying that I do uh, <laughs> I do. Uh, you know, close to full time marketing work for Mass Solutions, but oh, yeah, right, exactly. So, how do you want to kick this off? Uh, you're the, you're the host. I mean, let's talk a little bit of high school basketball, <laughs> okay? Because March Madness starts with <laughs> the playoffs in high school basketball, and we each have a son who finished their lengthy careers this year. How about that Pine Richland Latrobe? District uh, Whippeal 6A uh, basketball, and then they got into state playoffs. So the Whippeal champion, Pine Richland, was playing a, uh, I guess they finished third or fourth or fifth or whatever it was. So Latrobe is in the interdistrict playoffs to you know, advance towards the state championship. 83 to 82 victory for Pine Richland. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could have been there. I really do. I heard, heard a lot of great things about the game. I read about the game. You know, some some fantastic players on both sides, and a Latrobe team that got down twenty. How you can know, you be down twenty in the third quarter and then be ahead I, with thirteen seconds? Well, left. you know, that's the one thing with with both our sons playing against. You know, the Butler kids, or I'm sorry, the Latrobe kids, Butler and Biss especially. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we we both coached against those kids, and those kids were something pretty special for you know from the time they were in fourth, fifth grade, and. You know, the, you know, Butler's going to Holy Cross, and the Bisc kid could probably play Division three somewhere. And I think he could play D two. Yeah, you know, you know, so you know, that's a special group. I I felt I was rooting for Latrobe. I wanted to get a chance to see them play, um, which I haven't the last couple of years because they are really good kids, just like our kids. They just, uh, you know, they've had more success. Pine Richland, amazing job their coach Ackerman to get his fifth Whippeal three at Moon and two at Pine Richland. My youngest son Carter and I were at the Whippeal Championship, Pine Richland versus Butler, and the first half Pet Cash, their star one of their two star players, they have a number of really good players, but the two best known ones are Pet Cash and the, the quarterback Jakovic. 
or Jerk, how do you pronounce his name? Jerkovic. Jerkovic. And so uh, Pat Cash had maybe four points in the first half and was in foul trouble. And I said to Carter, I go, watch his third quarter. Just watch. I said, this is a real player. And sure enough, in the second half, I think he was eight for nine or seven for eight in that Whippeal Championship game because he's one of those guys that he knew he sat the bench and he knew he didn't have a good first half. He came out lights out concentration. Yeah. And they won the Whippeal against Butler. Matt Clement, the coach, played for the Cubs and other, other places in Major League Baseball, now is the coach of Butler. Butler upsets Austin Butler and Latrobe to get to the Whippeal final and play Pine Richland. And then Pine Richland beats Butler, and now Pine Richland beats Austin Butler and Jake Biss over Latrobe, eighty-three to eighty-two, to keep their state playoff hopes alive. Incredible, incredible stuff. Did you take in any of the the Whitfield finals at the Peterson? You did. You were there yes. for a few. I was there for about four <laughs> or five. I saw Nellie Cummings play an awful game. Uh, D one prospect supposedly, and he's going to Bowling Green. I look for him to end up at IUP or somewhere like that on the D2 level. Um, I think he's really talented, but I also think there's uh, it would be a struggle, I think, for him to play Division yeah. One. What do you think of uh, the Peterson for to, as a host for the, for the championships? Compared to Duquesne? Yes. Oh, man. It's a whole different level. It's so much better. You think it's better? I think it's so much better. What, what, yeah, I think... I struggle with that because I think sheerly because of the size, I, I think it, the Peterson is a little bit too big, you know, because it spreads out the fans it, and it's a great place to play. No doubt depends. about it, it as a depends. player. When we were watching Manesson play in the single A, it seemed somewhat vacant. But when you got to the 5A or the 6A girls, 6A girls was pretty full. Bethel Park, right. North Allegheny, 6A boys was I, I'm going to I'm going to say 85 percent capacity, and wow. if you have 85 percent capacity at the Pete, <laughs> that that that's blows impressive. Away yes. Duquesne, right? Which and, I wasn't there for the the six eight boys, and game, just so. the whole video thing. You're seeing the big screen, and you're watching replays. The watching of the replays was huge. Uh, walking in to the facility, just the whole aura of getting up near the facility, as opposed to you know. An, I have loyalties to Duquesne, spent some time there, and I think it's a great place. But driving up to the Palumbo Center is not as nice as driving up to Bethel Park's facility. Bethel Park's facility is actually better than the Palumbo Center. I agree. I've been there. So if there's a high school facility better than your D1 basketball facility, you got issues. Right. And I was saying that back then, so I'm not talking out of school. I said that to the president and the board of directors when I worked there, that that facility needs to be blown up and started over. So it's a completely different experience just from pulling up, walking up, going up uh, escalators <laughs> and seeing the uh, big screen. When you had the crowd for the 6A and the 5As, it was absolutely worth it. Yes, the Singway was was a little bit more vacant, but I still think they have the boxes uh, right on uh, court level. Right. So if you're a parent. Bethel Park was in the boxes. Bethel Park was the in the boxes. The A&AA schools can't afford to be in the boxes. There's only Bethel $10 Park was in there. more. <laughs> it's $10 more. You didn't have to be wealthy to be in there. But the parents, I would think, would have gone to that. And then you have a great experience there. Your court level, plus you've got the facility to have the food, drink, et cetera. I thought it was better. What do you do? You think that high school basketball is getting as big as high school football in in the Whippeal? No, not even close. Not even close. Not not even at playoff time. No. Okay. Interesting. Anything that one thing I noticed that I thought was good in the way of marketing, you know, businesses, you know, was that there were. You know, I don't know if there were some credit card companies or there were some tables set up in the concession area, which I don't know if they they had to pay to to rent those tables or whatnot. But I thought it was a pretty smart marketing tool to market your business there. And and I don't know what the businesses were because I didn't didn't really have time. I was you know anxious to get out of there. But you know, what a better way to market services like uh, individual skills training or physical therapy or anything like that. I mean, what a great way. Because with all the people that were going through there, 
you know, at, at, at night there were, you know, or the Saturday afternoon when there were three games in the afternoon and two more at night or whatnot. But what a, what a great way to promote your business because I, I think that, that high school basketball is getting bigger. Uh, you know, I, I think the particip- participation is up. So what a better way. Training is a big part of it now because, you know, kids are going single sport now and doing it year round. So, and kids have personal trainers and, but ultimately kids get hurt. You know, we, we, you know, even, you know, we talked about the mascara, mascara girl from Bethel park this year, tears an ACL, whatnot, but what a better way to market your services to, you know, a, a big, big market, you know, the, the, not the entire WPIL, but, but families and kids coming from all directions. I thought it was, I thought it was a, 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 a genius marketing idea to have some tables, some giveaways, promoting their businesses there at the WPIL championships. If I were to go randomly to a Friday night football game in the Whippeal and a random Friday night basketball game in the Whippeal, you would see the stark contrast. You go to a 6A schools basketball game and there's 50 people, 100 people. You go to that same school's football game and there's 1,000. So football is still king by a lot. Just is. Although playoff basketball is pretty well attended. Agree? Mm. Championship. Championship. Championship basketball yes. is Championship. pretty well attended. Yes. Okay. Still, the quality of players, just we're just never going to have it. I, I shouldn't say never, but the whip was just still – just not not a basketball hotbed by any means but as far as the quality of players or yes Yes. quality players versus eastern pa central pa well versus central pa were probably similar right probably even a little better right eastern pa not even close a top 10 market not even close top 20 market and not true in football though we're still not i don't think football's big anymore either we are what we are, and don't get me started on the coaches. Okay, no, we we don't we won't go there. <laughs> Could be a completely other show. Yes, it's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm Dave Mastovich. The show is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audio book over 180 thousand to choose from by going to audible.com/nobs. That's audible.com/nobs. You sign up, you get one credit per month for a book. You can stockpile them; they roll over right now. I haven't got a few in a few months, so I have four credits, but you can get books, sports books. You can get uh, the Jerry West book, really good book from a few years ago. You can get business books. Uh, Robert Cialdini's Persuasion is now out. Get that great new book about Airbnb and Uber. It's called The Upstarts. All those books on audible.com. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for you to listen on your iPhone, iPad, Android, anything. So you can listen while you drive, while you work out, while you cook, while you do whatever, and pound out some books. March Madness brings with it all kinds of marketing opportunities. It also brings with it some productivity issues. And we, with the pools that we have, where it can be a a welcome diversion for American workers, but... Those distracted college football fans, follow, college basketball fans following their brackets will cost U.S. employers the most on record this year in terms of lost productivity, and it pretty much breaks its own record every year. But based on an estimate that 23.7 million employees will use company time to research, construct, and check their NCAA basketball tournament brackets this year, U.S. employers stand to lose $615 million per hour in wages to distracted workers, according to calculations by Challenger, Gray, and Christmas, an outplacement firm. If applied to high-end estimates that 81.5 million workers will spend at least an hour on their brackets, employer losses rise to as much as $2.1 billion. What do you think about that? All the time spent on brackets. What should companies do, Tom? Well, Dave, i, I tell you what. The I would take a different approach to it. I, I think that you you should turn the brackets into a a team builder. Okay, 
because let's say you have an office of 30 people and let's say, you know, there's maybe only one or two guys like us that follow basketball the way they do. But then there's maybe another four to six guys that know basketball. And but, but ultimately, you're going to have, I don't know, a third of the office that I don't want to say just doesn't care about basketball, but they don't have any real interest. OK, but what a better way. I mean, even the, the third that that have no interest. I'm sure they've got a dad or a brother or a husband or someone that does follow college basketball. So what a better way to do a team building exercise and get everybody involved in the office pool, you know, and, and, you know, turn it into a team builder. I agree. I think it's a good idea. I think that the, to take a proactive approach, it's going to happen no matter what. They're streaming. Correct. There's the ability to look on your phone. There's the ability to get the alerts. You're you're going to talk about it with with uh, coworkers. Uh, do something around it to make it more of a positive and to make it more of a team builder because that productivity is going to be lost anyway. You are going to have some people spending time away from work doing that. All right. Even do do a Friday afternoon luncheon and and turn the games on if if you have access in the office. You know, basically give the give the office a, a break and just say, Hey, you know, cater a lunch, <laughs> you know, they could stay, you know, make the, the office pool, you know, if you charge something or not charge something, but, you know, throw a little something in for the winner, you know, and, and it's bragging rights. It's something to talk about. You know, the guys don't want to lose to the gals, you know, it, it tur- turn it in. Like you said, ultimately it's going to happen anyway. So turn it into something positive, something that the officer look forward to. From a marketing standpoint, you see the big national companies doing promotions around it, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings and whoever's the major sponsors of the network uh, broadcasts. What you really have an opportunity is if you're a regional company or a small company is to do something tied to it and promote it via social media and be uh, upbeat about it and be positive about it. So let's say we had uh, did the same thing that you're talking about and we had the 10 or 15 people involved here at Mass Solutions, uh, Sarah's big on using digital media and social media and Facebook Live. You can pull into all kinds of different ways to try to get some visibility as a smaller, uh, small or regional company and really leverage that March Madness uh, capabilities by showing that you're doing something creative. And I think it's an opportunity that a lot of small companies miss because they just don't even think in terms of, well, how could we do something for March Madness? We're not papa john's and we're not uh buffalo wild wings right and and as far as the the, you know the march madness to to me the 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 ones who got it right and did it the best is espn their million dollar bracket challenge gets people onto their website no matter who the people are people say i get a free shot at a million dollars i'm gonna take it you know, most of them not realizing the astronomical odds of it happening hasn't happened. It'll never happen. I mean, you know, Mass Solutions could run a ten million dollar bracket challenge for a perfect entry, and, and it's not going to happen. I mean, it would be horrible luck if you ran it and it did. But you could take a risk like that. Well, we ESPN, buy the insurance. You know, all those places buy the insurance absolutely, to cover the absolutely, win. which doesn't cost them much. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a drop in the bucket for them. But it's a it's a fantastic way. And and no matter what website you get on, now, no matter what you're doing, what pops up before you can actually get to what you're doing, ads. So for for small, you know, for, for smaller companies, again. You know, you could you could instead of just shying away from something like this and 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 saying, oh, you know, we're going to lose productivity, this and that, you know, what a better way. Find something different, you know, than your competition's doing to create interest. So, Dave, are, we, next year, maybe, you know, let's see how the year goes. And if you if you don't leave the business and disappear on us, maybe we do a 10 million dollar mass solutions bracket challenge and and. See what kind of buzz we can create here in the city. It's interesting that no one's done that. Right, exactly. Just make fun that, of the That's ESPN why maybe it's us. It maybe it's million. maybe it's Mass Solutions time. And then they to could be just, a trend just breaker. Buy the insurance, right? That covers you. And, well, right. Buy the insurance, and or maybe we don't. And and if someone does it, then we disappear. <laughs> then Mass Solutions will be for sale. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
It's the No BS Marketing Show. We're talking about March Madness from many different angles. We talked a little bit about Whippeal basketball since we're in the Whippeal here in Pittsburgh and it's playoff season there. We then talked about the productivity impact and how companies would be better served to to at least embrace it or ignore it rather than ignore it. I don't think there's any way to stomp it out. You always hear a story every year about somebody that tries to stop people from doing it. They just look like morons. So you can either ignore it or embrace it. We recommend embracing it by trying to turn it into something productive and team building. Then we talk about March Madness marketing and how the big companies have really leveraged it. But if you're a local or a regional company, take advantage of it. Do something creative about it. It ties back to that team building, but also a chance for you to use social media and be able to get something out there that shows that you do take a proactive approach to it. You do have the team building aspect and it gets you exposure. Also from a B, B to C company, business to consumer company, should be considering ways to use the messaging around March Madness to have creative promotions, whether it's a discount or some kind of special. And again, push that out uh, in a cost-effective way through a lot of sweat equity through your social media, your digital media, to be able to leverage these times of the year. I think really what it comes down to is messaging is, emo- is about making an emotional impact and making it memorable. So anytime you have something that everyone can relate to across the country, as you said, even someone that's not a basketball fan knows what the term March Madness means. The vast majority of people do. So companies can use that for promotions about their products and services and bundling them for discounts, can use it for productivity, uh, enhancing productivity and team building, but then promote that you're doing that. A lot of different ways to get creative with the March Madness. Agree. It's great how the terms end up becoming, you think about what's probably been about 15 years, I'd say. I don't think it's much more than that. When somebody on one of the networks used the term bracketology. Right. And now it's just been become uh, part of the vernacular and everybody says they've got the, the bracketology when they're filling out their brackets. How many do you fill out a year? I might do one or two. Yeah, I'm not into them very much. No. I find no. them to be pretty stupid well i mean it, it is fun but my like my son gets into it so i'll try to coach people along you know if they're looking for upsets that's what yeah. i like to do everybody now knows to look at that five no, five seed versus 12 five, seed. 12 correct let's talk about let's have a little bit of fun with the march madness talk about the all-time best ncaa tournament players okay now there's a clear number one i don't know if you'll if you'll agree, but there is a clear number one and then there's probably even a clear number two, but then after that it gets pretty murky. So if you're picking the greatest players of uh, college basketball history in the tournament, doesn't necessarily mean they turned out to be the greatest NBA players. Right. If you're picking that, you'd have to go with number one. There, there's who would be my number one. Yes. Christian Leighton. Absolutely. Okay. Has to be number one. Yes. And you can hate him. There's people that hate uh, him. But there's a 30 for 30 on him. But absolutely number one. Absolutely. Uh, sheer volume of wins in the tournament, number of games played, championships, right. performances. So right. he's number one. Mm-hmm. Then you can go. It, 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 it gets tough after that. It does. It gets tough after that. Uh, Do you go Bill Walton? Do you go Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Yeah, well, you know, the UCLA teams were so dominating, and you know, for so long. Bill Walton had the one game where he was like 21 for 22 in the championship yeah. game. You, Some ridiculous. He, he, he would belong in the conversation for sure. Now, Jabbar lost one of his three, didn't he? Because he could only play in three. Freshman, you weren't eligible. I'm no, not. No, Walton lost one of his. Jabbar right. won all three. Right. So Jabbar would then have to be ahead of Walton. So Jabbar would probably be number two. I'm yeah. thinking, thinking Walton would be high up there. Uh, Magic only played two years, had that one great year. Right. Jordan made it as a well, freshman and made the game when he shot as a freshman. Right. But then he left after his junior year, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. So that that's... Who do you have from the past 15 years? Wow. That's tough. You know... uh the kid from Syracuse, the one and done freshman, uh, led his team to the title from way back when. Mello? No, 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 no. Just, just in the last uh, fifteen years. Yeah, Carmelo. Yes, Carmelo. Right. 
I'm not. I, I, I would he put him there. He could one win. And done, he one proved and he could he, win. He was a one and done, and a one and done that won a NCAA championship. So I'd have to put him in the conversation because he really took that team to a whole whole different level. Absolutely. What about uh, all time coaches in the NCAA tournament? Well, I mean, I, I I have a special place in my heart for Valvano for what what he what he did at uh, uh, what he did at NC State. I mean, although they're better coaches than him, he was might have been the best motivator, mm-hmm. you know. And, and as as far as marketing goes, you know, he, he became the brand at at NC State. Now it also led to his downfall, uh, but he really, you know, he really marketed not only the university, but he marketed to the common man, you know, this, this he's t- always telling stories about in his household an Italian guy. And, you know, he's using terms like we love each other and you got to laugh and you got to cry. And, you know, so I, as far as impact goes, I, you know, I think Valvano was, was right up there. You know, well, we talk a lot about storytelling on this show and the company Mass Solutions is all about helping people tell their stories and making those stories memorable where they make an emotional impact. From a storytelling standpoint, Jim Valvano is one of the all time greats beyond basketball. Yeah, right. I mean, that speech, that SB speech. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. When he's dying from cancer. Right. And he gets up there, and then the, the, the teleprompters are going yeah, on, and right. they start playing the music that he's right. supposed to be done. And he goes, right. "What are you talking about? Yeah. I got I'm, cancer soaring through my veins, right. and you're going to tell me I have to leave." Right. That's a that's a really great one. But his stories that even before his demise, while he was still coaching, the stories that you you hear and you see the the pregame speeches and the way he motivated his team and the way he kept that team that won it all after they lost their best player and thought he wasn't going to be able to come back, right. and then he came back for the tournament. And they won six games that were all close and then upset one of the top teams of all time. A lot of that through motivational sp- storytelling. Yeah, I mean, he was. I, I cannot, every time that 30 for 30 is on, I cannot turn it off. He, he was he was something. You know, on the flip side, though, is, is you know, with his success, you know, he, he, he I don't want to say he couldn't handle it, but he overextended himself and he got away with away from what got him there which was his coaching you know so his public appearances and all that he got spread out thin and it 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 I don't want to say it ruined the brand but you know he, he potentially could have taken NC State to a higher and higher level but it was a very short-lived success there and they really haven't built on that like other programs have if it weren't for Jimmy V we'd have never met Jimmy V's why I coach basketball. Oh, really? Yeah. I told my mom I was a kid and I watched that championship game. I swear my mom will tell you this. Uh, I said, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to be a basketball coach. Wow. And, uh, and she said, why? And I just said, wow, I've always thought about it, but this guy, so he, he, he made a big impact on me. Yeah. Me too. I don't know if that's why I got into coaching basketball, but, um, yeah, that's just quite a story. That just really rings true year after year after year. I mean, there are greater coaches than Jim Valvano. There's no doubt about it. We talk about the greatest coaches of, uh, you know, of all time, and, and you got to bring up Krzyzewski's name and Bobby's not, Bobby Knight's name um, and, and Dean Smith, you know. But as far as, you know, eclectic, as far as a guy that, that, that people related to, it, it, Jimmy V, no for, doubt about for, it. For guys of a certain age, Jimmy V – Really made an impact. If you were a preteen or a teenager in the eighties, you he made an impact. No, no doubt. It, well, and and you and I talk about this all the time about the impact that our fathers have always had in our lives. My dad was so impressed; he could not believe because Valvano was was the first that said, "You know, if I'm down ten points with five minutes going a game, I'm going to start sending teams to the line." Yep. You know, and coaches didn't do that. You know, and and he would take a game that was tied with a minute to go, and the other team was playing for the last shot. He, he'd say, "No, I'm going to foul you." You know, I, I I want the last shot. You know, which was crazy. Yes. You know, you, it's a tie ball game. Why would you foul? My dad was so impressed with that. He was like, "Do you believe this guy?" Not like he's crazy, but but like, well, he's a little bit crazy. But 
th- this is great. This is unbelievable. My father was so impressed with Jimmy V. And, um, and, and so, you know, I wanted to watch too, you know, and, uh, yeah. It's interesting when you go through the many types of coaches, because it's just like in business, there's many types of CEOs, many types of leaders. When you go through that list of the great ones and you talk about Krzyzewski, who I think you have to put at the top in college, uh, because Wooden was in an era when there was less competition and his was sheer dominance and he deserves it. He ended up, he was a great man. I, I have about three or four John Wooden books and the pyramid's great. But I just think at that time to dominate was a lot, a lot easier than it is for Krzyzewski who hasn't dominated to that level, but he's come pretty close to that level for a long time. So I think Krzyzewski's in his own spot. Then you have Bobby Knight who was, a big time disciplinarian, very simple uh, mindset of how the coach was the boss. The players didn't have any say, and he had tremendous success for about fifteen, twenty years. Then he had about ten to fifteen years where he was good, but still nowhere near that. And I think his message died. Then you have Dean Smith, who uh, was really a process guy. If you think about it, they're CEOs that are sometimes process guys, and they make it big. That's what Dean Smith was. It wasn't charisma. It was very much the process and the system. And I actually think he probably lost his team some of the bigger games. I think that just the way, I think in big game coaching, he wasn't like a Valvano who could adapt or Krzyzewski who adapts. And then you have a guy like John Calipari, who we know, a Western Pennsylvania guy from Moon, played at Clarion. And he is a phenomenal recruiter, a great motivator, really a caring guy. You just hear story after story about how much he tries to help people that uh, he knows and that played for him. Yet you look at him and he wasn't thinking to foul against when he was at Memphis and lost in the national championship game. And he let a guy make a three to, I think, send in an overtime. I'm going off the top of my head here. But multiple times in his career, he's been criticized for his game management. But yet you can, you really don't have it all. That's why Krzyzewski so different because he has the game management. He's respected. He has the caring about the players and he has the ability to recruit. That's why I think I put him at the top, because when you look at Calipari, he has that incredible leadership and ability to recruit and charisma, but I don't think he's a good game coach. I've watched game after game where I say, what's he doing? Why doesn't he have someone standing beside him just to tell him what to do at that point? Right. So it's just interesting to see how, because the same thing happens in business. You have a process guy who will take his company to a level. You have an Elon Musk guy who's a big vision guy, right. you know, and so there's all kinds of different leadership styles. Your thoughts on which ones of those you how you rank those guys? Which ones do you well, like? Well, I, I agree with you know all the points that you made. What 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 sticks out the most is is you know when you talk about coaching or when you're talking about business, you know, say you're a new young coach, okay, and you're you know you have your own ideas, but you know how good are you going to be? How good are you going to? Is your team going to be? I, I think a lot of it is is copycatting. You see things from that other coaches do well, and and if and if you have the personnel, you copy it or some form of it. Same way in business, you know, you you, you see something that another business is doing well. I mean, I, I see it in some of my manufacturing businesses. We decide we're going to go after the same market, copying what our competition does. We're just going to do it a little bit better or a little bit different. You know, it's I I, I think it's all part of it. You know, so it, as as far as how you 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 know, as far as how I would rank the great coaches, you know, I, I don't know if, if I would definitely put one ahead of all the others because their styles are different, you know, and, 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 uh, and kids change. We talk about that all the time with high school kids, completely different now coaching a high school kid versus when you and I were high school players, you know? So, uh, you know, all the different levels of personalities, uh, you know, I, I think we're fortunate to just you know, you and I now that we're getting up there in years to have been around a, a, a lot of of different type of coaches, intelligent coaches, smart coaches, coaches that find different ways to get the most out of their product, just like in business. I also think that we live in a society that's so critical that even if someone's done a lot, we still sometimes criticize them for uh, not doing the total winning of the championship. But then with that, there are some valid criticisms. So I'll take a guy who did great things for the university of Pittsburgh. Jamie Dixon helped build that program when it was in disarray, he and Ben Holland, and he took it to a certain level 
So he deserves tremendous accolades. And when you compare him to the vast majority of coaches in the world, he's in the upper 5%. However, he's not in the upper 1% or 2% because he makes it about him. Everything has to be his decision. Right. Every set is called by him. Every offensive play, every defensive play, the players are shackled. And in this day and age, you just can't do that. What you, what you, the winning coaches now build a process and give you a read and react. And so on the one hand, I want to give Jamie Dixon praise because he took a downtrodden program and he took it to the top, but then he leveled off. And the reason he leveled off is you can't get the premier player. If that player comes to watch your team play and sees that you call every play and he loses a lot of his individuality and his creativity. So he does deserve accolades for being in that top, say, 10% of all coaches of all of the world. Yeah. Because if you think about it, if you take every coach in the world, you're taking high school coaches, youth coaches, college coaches. He's definitely better than the vast majority, but he's not in that top tier because he can't get that group to the final four and he won't at his new place either unless he changes dramatically and lets players have more uh, flexibility. Right. I mean, well, and yet, nonetheless, he, he's still tremendously successful. Yes, that's my Tremendously point. successful. But in the business that he's in, you know, he took it to a level where there were, are still 10 to 12 to 15 programs that were consistently still doing it better than his. So he kind of reached – the end of the end of his time here, you yeah. know, and not that Pitt was going to force him out, but he probably had that feeling like I either got to make a change, you know, or it's, it's going to be the end of my run here. You know? Well, the so, thing that, the thing that uh, it comes down to is you in both the NBA and college, you get to pick your players to some degree, but it does come down to the players. So the process that Jamie Dixon used Deserves a lot of credit. He does. And he was able to recruit some pretty good players. But to win it all, you have to have great players. Right. And uh, he's he's not able to do that with his current style. But I guess the other second point is the one we're both making is that he's still tremendously successful and deserves to be receive a lot of praise. And he does. He receives praise in the tune of making millions of dollars. So he's in the wealthiest of Americans. The problem that I see is that we're so critical and we're so hypercritical that we don't acknowledge that he's excellent and we don't acknowledge that whoever lost the Super Bowl was still amazing. I've coached a lot of years and this year I had a, I was fortunate to coach a really good team and you don't get to pick your players when you're coaching for a school district. And we were, I don't know, something like 30 and four or something like that. I can't remember the exact static. I, I could be off if I'm no, off. I think it's it's from our conversations, whatever. probably yeah. pretty close Two leagues. So about 20 games a league. So we lost a game and um, a dad in casual conversation with me, brings up that game and he just goes, so why didn't you press more? We seem to be really better when we're pressing. And I just started laughing and I said, I don't know. And I just didn't say anything. But the point was to him, that was my fault. Now I could be wrong. Maybe he was just having a bad day and he was in passing, making that point. But throughout my life, that's what's happened. The people will bring up that game. And the first thing is we're, we're coaching without, scouting we're coaching without a locker room we're coaching without game film because you can't most under, times without assistance without assistance or with assistants that aren't coaching the whole team they're right. often coaching right. just one player um, sometimes they aren't sometimes i've been fortunate i've had some good assistance but sometimes you don't so when you get that situation you're really doing something that w when i had all those things earlier in my career when i was was coaching at a different level it makes a big difference to be able to look at film. It makes a big difference to send someone to scout a team. Uh, in the old days, you had to send someone to scout a team, whereas now you just get the film. Um, the chalk talk before the game matters. You don't have that now. But again, getting back to the original point is this guy didn't do it with malice. He wasn't a complete ass. Right. But yet he's so ignorant right. that, A, I don't remember that game. It's eight games ago, and we had uh, won 22 in a row and lost one. Hmm, we're probably going to lose one. They're 13, 14, whatever. Um, and then number two, what, what are you talking about? You're not in the locker room. You're not in the practices. You're not managing the team. You don't see what's going on. You don't know the other team. And that particular team happened to have two really strong guards. So I didn't press as much because the strong guards break it easier. But the point is, it's not even worth discussing that. It's no matter what someone finds fault oh, yeah. that 
that is ignorant about it. And it's a messaging standpoint. At that point, you have to decide how are you going to handle that from a messaging standpoint. I did say a little bit. I just said, hey, you know, that team has some couple strong guards. We still did press, um, but I don't have all the pictures in front of me. That's about right. five games ago. Right. You know, so it comes down to messaging. Uh, how do you address that? And everybody has their own approach. Some coaches just completely blow it off. Right. Some, I, I think it is good to at least try to give some messaging. What do you think? Well, it, you know, I, what I really think is that it's because of today's society and because, like you said, everybody's hypercritical, especially when you get down to the, to the youth level, you, any, any basketball coaching that is of a volunteer level, you know, it is very ignorant to criticize, you know, I mean, if at any level a parent is just to keep their mouth completely shut, it's of at the volunteer level. Okay, when kids get to high school, you know, I get it. Now these coaches are being paid, but they're they're not being paid anything. They're being paid peanuts. Right. Now, I'm not gonna say they're volunteers, but you and I both know uh, only a certain like you know, based on what your career is during the day, can you even be a high school coach? Right. And, and and most of those guys are either retired guys or guys who are teachers themselves. You know I mean? So the pool of, of, of good coaches is, is severely limited, you know, even in high school. So, you know, because I'm, I'm the parent of, of a player that played high school ball, you know, and, and, you know, I, I've just have found that, even though I've coached a game and I, and you know, you, you're, I'm sure you're the same way, Dave, and all coaches are. We look at games differently than the common people. Yes. Okay. And there are criticisms, but given what the guy who's coaching my son is making to do that job, I should keep my mouth shut. Maybe not with that, but uh, <laughs> let, let me give you the better example of that. So uh, Bethel Park has a amazing run one year. They had three, really strong football players that were top notch, top notch, three of the best players in the area. And they go 15 and 0 and they're playing in the state championship game. So we all buses of people from Bethel Park go and we're all in the same hotel and, and they lose in overtime. Now high school overtime, you go back and forth. Yeah, right. It's kind of, and I can't remember if it was one or two or three, but the fact is it's in overtime and you lose on a play that they complete the pass for the touchdown. And after the game, there's people criticizing the coach. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you like that coach or not, whether you agree with him or not, right. his team went 15-0, and right. and they lost in overtime. So you could have done better than him by one play. So don't criticize him. Right. Whether you like him or not, right. don't criticize him. They were 15-0. and and lost in friggin' overtime. And it wasn't an egregious, like, he called uh, some crazy play, right. a flea a flicker. A flea flicker, yeah. right, from the one-yard line. lost right. Right. on a play. Yeah. And I'm at the hotel, and these people were talking about it, and I said, look, I'm not going to sit here and say I think he's, uh, you know, he's Bill Belichick or, or Chuck Noll. I, I'm not going to say I think he right. stinks. I'm going to say that the team's 15-0, and we lost by one play. Let's applaud the guy. Let's praise him. Let's tell him he had a great year. Right. Because believe me, he's human, so he's going to make mistakes next year or the year after. Right. But this year ain't the year to say anything. And these morons were still criticizing him. We lost the game because of him. It's insane. Well, it, you know, it, to, society's opinions are formulated based on what we see all the time. And what we see is we see collegiate and professional sports teams playing where guys are making coaches, especially are making unbelievable amounts of money. So, you know, we, we don't separate society doesn't separate the two. So whatever we see at the college level, we expect at the high school level, not fair. It's not fair. Uh, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's just, it's not fair. It's not a fair, it's not an apples to apples comparison. You just can't do it. Now, the thing I will comment about high school coaches that I will be critical is I think their messaging and their communication is often severely limited and lacking. And I can speak to that because that's what I do. Right. That's what I am an expert at. Right. And as an expert at communication, I found high school coaches across the board to be lacking. Even the better ones are not as good communicators as their 
peers would be as leaders in business. Right. And and that's that's sometimes egos involved. They feel like they don't have to communicate. I stress to any coach that I talk to that you have the general public is a target audience. You need to communicate to them. Parents are a target audience. Your players are a target audience. The teachers in the school are a target audience. The administrators are the are a target audience, and alumni are target audience. You've got six target audiences, and I don't care that you say I only make ten grand to do this. You chose the job, right? That part of the job sucks, but you have to do it, right? You have to do it. Just being good at the X's and O's, and just being good at motivating people, isn't enough. You have to communicate to these six audiences. You need to communicate to alumni so they support you. You need money, whatever type of school you're in. You need the teachers so they support you and help make sure that your players are being educated and doing what they need to do. And staying eligible. And staying eligible. <laughs> you need the parents because the parents, first of all, they're your customer. And right. this is the arrogance that comes in. I'm right. the customer right. of the varsity basketball coach this year. I'm his customer. Whether he wants to admit that or not, right. I'm his customer. Okay, he needs to talk to me right. and he needs to communicate to me and he needs to tell me what his rationale is. Otherwise, we're going to read between the lines and be negative. So those are the customer. Then the players are the customer. And in today's world, you have to communicate to them. You can't just dictate and you have to be rational about it. And that's the problem I have with so many coaches is it's whimsical. They make a whimsical decision that impacts a kid's psyche for a long time, for a long time. I I think yeah, you are spot on with that. You are. You know, because th to me, I, I think back to the coaches that I had growing up, Catholic grade school, league, high school, whatever. You know, and, and, and that's why I, I think about it more and more now as I get a little bit older and I'm close to 50 years old and I've been coaching for 10, 15 years now. And now I'm coaching my daughters. You know, what is it really about as a coach at a volunteer level or at a high school level? I mean, you know, what is it really about? What it should be about is, you know, how do you determine your success as a coach? Is it actually by your wins or, and losses? Or is it about that player that that remembers you and come back, comes back to you 20 years down the road and says how much I enjoyed playing for you? You know, may, maybe not what a great coach you were or what a horrible coach you were, but, but how did I remember my experience playing for Coach Mastovich? I mean, that's what really matters when you're not, when it's not your career, when it's not your job to win games like it is at the collegiate or the professional level. I mean, you're there to make an impact on these young lives. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. I run into players I first had the chance to coach and I was coaching players only a few years old, younger than me when I got right out of college. And then I left the area, that area. So years later, when those players got married, I was invited to weddings and so forth. But I left 20 years ago. I left that area. And uh, but I still have those contacts where I reach and run into them. And I'm only a few years old and they still call me coach. And then just the other day, I got a text from a player who's in college now, uh, multiple years in college, and says, Coach, can I pick your brain can I take you out to dinner for to pick your brain? And I said, sure, where do you want to go? He goes, Chipotle, <laughs> <laughs> which was awesome to me. I thought that's so great, a 21, 22-year-old uh, yeah. saying, let's go to Chipotle. So I, we go to Chipotle, and he was surprised I bought. And I said, no, I got this. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I got this. We're okay, buddy. Um, and, and it was just so flattering to me that he wanted to uh, ask advice. So I, I give him the advice and everything. And then at, when it ended, he said um, – he goes, I've always loved you, but I love you even more now. And coaching, playing for you was one of the greatest experiences of my high school years. Now, that that means a hell of a lot more than whether we won an absurdly high amount of games, which I will say we did. But uh, that means a lot more than the 87% winning percentage or whatever it was. Right. Because you're impacting your life. And to your point, you know, my best sport was basketball, but – a coach that made the most impact on me was a baseball coach. And the second most was probably a football coach. Now my high school basketball coach made an impact on me because he was great at teaching the game. He didn't know how to lead and motivate and he was horrible with people. Right. So he left scars that I still have, but the processes that he taught me is what helped make me a coach. And then my college coach added to that with the, the, the schemes and the strategies. But isn't that interesting that I played all three sports and, and the high school basketball coach would be a distant fifth. I mean, there's youth coaches that would come ahead because they made more of a positive impact on me because he didn't know how to deal with people. 
right. high school basketball coach. He did not deal with people. He was rude and 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 mean and just you just it was just wrong. And right. that impact lasts forever. Right. Well, right. And and again, in, in today's day and age, like you said, you you have to be more about just coaching the sport. You know, you have to communicate and and like we talk about, you know, what is your message? And, and the message should should all funnel from the individual kids, you know, and and the message that you're giving them to take forward in life. I mean, you know, I mean, again, the pay is not there for you to make them the best basketball player or football player they can be. I mean, for what you're getting paid, concentrate on giving them the life experience. I look at certain coaches and I say, like, I watched this Lincoln Park Whitfield Championship game against North Catholic. And this is part strategy, but part how they motivated the players. And and, and it comes down to communication. The Lincoln Park coach uh, appears to be not strong. Uh, don't have enough evidence to make a clear-cut example, but in that game – he coached poorly, and his players were disorganized. There was uh, there was frustration. There was it was just bad. They had a Division One player who's a senior and a sophomore who's projected to be Division One player. That alone in basketball, unlike football, well, even in football, one superstar, but in basketball, one Division One player against a bunch of Division Three potential players probably could be enough in most instances. Yeah. I would say nine out of ten times. Then you throw in a second one, and plus his third, fourth, and fifth guys were pretty damn good. Right. So he clearly had the better team. Right. And didn't win. But over here on the other side, this North Catholic coach really impressed me because they just played such a flow of a game. Everyone seemed positive. Uh, the one kid hung, hung his head once, and he immediately got him to keep his head up. And that's hard. You know, I know with uh, with my youngest son, it's, uh, you know, he makes a mistake. He's very hard on himself. This coach was able to keep everyone's head up. And he even called the one kid, took him out and said, I'm going to take you out again if you hang your head because I sat right behind the bench. And so there you saw communication taking a team that was good. And they were probably the better all-around team. But in basketball, having two or three really good players, especially at that age, that other coach uh, really should have won the game. Right. Well, and then, you know, the way he coached that individual player in that moment in time not only sends a message to that player, but the entire team. Exactly. It's all about uh, it's all about leadership and communication, which is what the No BS Marketing Show is all about. And Tom Rodriguez informed me today that this is his third appearance. I didn't even realize that he is uh, he is like the Alec Baldwin to Saturday Night Live. I guess. <sighs> wow, that's quite a compliment. Either that or I'm, I'm disappointed. That or I, I heard that Baldwin said he won't he he will no longer be doing the Trump impersonations because Trump was, you know, on him about it like ridiculously. I don't know if that'll that'll come to fruition. I think you'll keep doing it. I, I hope so. But the other thing I could do is I can make you the Richard Lewis of uh, Johnny Carson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Dave. Do you remember come being on. little kids and the Johnny Carson show would be on if you were if they forgot to send us to bed, we were all excited and we oh, watched yeah. like five to ten minutes of yeah. it. I was telling my class, college class the other night, I said, you know, these the nightly news used to matter. There were only three stations, and so everybody right. watched. <laughs> Absolutely, and that was that was until like ninety five. Uh, yeah. So you know what? Internet hit big. What ninety six, ninety seven? Everybody says earlier, but really, that's when it. Right. So through that point, you still watched uh, mm -hmm. one network, NBC, three networks. Yeah, three networks for the Tonight Show. Yep, your boy Lester Holt. Anything else that you want to add about our special March Madness episode? I don't know if I have anything, Dave. Well, Tom, thanks for being here. Uh, really enjoyed bringing you back the third time. We'll get you back. You get to be the guest host next time. Oh, that would be great. I'm all for it. You can work with Sarah, and you guys can build a special interview template to interview me. Right. Uh, maybe we could do it in conjunction with next year's $10 million Mass Solutions bracket challenge. We'll have to do it before that. We'll <laughs> okay. do that next year. We'll do the bracket, ta bracket challenge next year as well. But we have to do one. And since since we've been on almost uh, 20 months, you've been coming in every three Every six months, so yeah. we should probably get you back by August or so. As long as I have something to offer still. As long as you don't have somebody better, Dave. To our listeners, thanks for listening. Remember, you can get show notes and all kinds of other marketing, leadership, communications, messaging details at MassSolutions.biz. That's B-I-Z. You can get the book, Get Where You Want to Go, my first book from a few years ago. If you shoot me an email at Dave at MassSolutions.biz. And just ask for it and say you listen to the great Tom Rodriguez, and you'll get the $27 retail value 
of that book free of charge. We'll even pay shipping for you. That's a rare ep- a rare offer that we're going to make. Also, sign up for light reading when you go to MassSolutions.biz. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. We bring it out in a week in review now, once a week. You get a week in review that talks about everything that happened from a messaging standpoint that week. Again, you can find it at MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer.